Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Social Determinants of Health Insights and Analytics, Delayed Care in 2023. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available within one to two business days. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen on a PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. And finally, I'd like to remind you of AHIP's antitrust statement located in the link just below the slide viewer. We will, as always, comply with that statement. Among other things, the antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. We're very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Ronnie Aravamudin and Kelly McDivitt. Dr. Ronnie leads HDMS Clinical Advisory Services. She is known for her work in data-driven transformation, workflow design and development, value-based care, risk management, and clinical quality and performance reporting. Kelly is president of the Integrated Benefits Institute. Prior to this, she served as National Vice President of Enterprise Strategic Accounts at United Healthcare, leading the Center for Advanced Analytics. And at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to the speakers. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Uh, <clears throat> first, I'd like to thank AHIP for giving us this opportunity to present to all of you and to all of our audience members who uh, have taken the time out on your busy Friday to come and listen to us. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. So today, I would just uh, very quickly give us a quick rundown of what we'll be talking about. Um, as Joanne introduced the topic, she said we're going to be talking about the impact of delayed care. And, um, you know, that is something that has been on the minds of a um, lot of us since 2020. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how um, the social determinants of health, where we live, um, what our communities look like, um, really uh, affect the patterns of care and where we get care. And then how are businesses, um, especially plan sponsors, uh, using these analytics um, to really drive better health within their populations? Kelly will then touch on the other costs of healthcare, like I like, I like to uh, call them, because when we talk about healthcare costs, we typically only think about uh, the medications, the hospitals, the doctor's visits, et cetera. But what about um, the time that is spent off of work? What about the time that somebody um, has to take off without pay? All of that still goes towards the cost of healthcare. So Kelly will um, take us through some of those um, numbers and the um, findings that we've seen there. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, introduce our uh, delayed and deferred care patterns. Like I said, we've been, um, you know, talking about this um, for two or three years now since, um, you know, the pandemic hit and all of us had to stay home and all that jazz. Um, why are we still talking about it, right? Well, for one thing, because this was an unprecedented um, event that has occurred in our lifetimes. Obviously, it has changed a lot of things. Um, care patterns, you know, um, for starters, obviously. Um, and then as we uh, move forward, we have more and more data now that we can look back at. And typically data, as we all know, tells some wonderful stories, um, presents some great patterns. And um, now with more data, we're probably able to discern better patterns, better um, insights. So that's kind of the reason that we're still uh, talking about this. And I would think that we're gonna be talking about this for a long time to come. So um, all of the data set that um, I will be presenting here today, so let me tell you a little bit about that. So the data set that we analyzed here is a composite de-identified data from one of our existing customers at HDMS, which um, for those of you that are new um, to this AHIP webinar, HDMS is a wholly owned uh, subsidiary of CVS Health. We provide um, data warehousing and analytic solutions um, for our market, which consists of uh, employers, employer channels, health plans, and brokerage firms. 
So if you need more information, by all means, let Sarah or I know, we'd be happy to um, give that to you. So what we analyzed here was uh, a, a large client of ours whose data has been de-identified. Um, the client has a little over, I think, close to 80, set over 75 uh, self-funded and fully funded um, companies under their uh, employers under their belt. Um, they represent all different types of industries from manufacturing, um, healthcare, uh, city governments, um, education, lots of them, everything, tech, uh, retail, all of them. And um, that roughly amounts to a little over 250,000 members, including employees, spouses, and dependents. Um, and of course, because they are spread out all over the country, uh, the data that we receive is from multiple carriers, depending on the uh, employer, depending on the region, et cetera. Now, in this particular data set, um, as you can see, uh, you know, the, the top pie chart kind of gives you a breakdown of uh, the membership by age. And most of the members, 40%, a little over 40% of the members are between the 40 to 64 um, age group. And then uh, most of the rest of them are a slightly younger in the 18 to 39 age group. So that kind of makes the bulk of the, uh, um, you know, membership for uh, all of these companies combined. And um, the male to female ratio is uh, more, uh, you know, female than male, as you can see there. So that's the basics. This is what, this is the data that we analyzed. So what did we analyze and what did we find? Let's take a look. So because we're talking about uh, deferred and delayed care, we took a look in this data set of, um, you know, for utilization um, across uh, the last four years. So starting in 2019, um, which was the pre-pandemic year, and then through 2020, 21, and 22. Now, for 2022, we have 10 months worth of data. So for that reason, uh, for the other years too, the data was adjusted to have January through October data, just so we're comparing apples to apples. And then we compared the utilization for the six most common um, chronic conditions across the country um, within this data set. And so what did we find? As you can see, for almost everybody, the um, utilization went down um, quite dramatically in 2020, as would be expected, and then bounced back, except for a couple at the bottom there, you see, um, you know, for, um, I think this one is uh, for asthma, um, it kind of stayed fairly flat. It didn't really, I mean, there is a decrease, but it's not very pronounced as you might see for the cancers or for um, hypertension and such up at the top there. Um, so it went down quite dramatically and then it started to come back up um, with a quite a bit of a bounce back in 2021. And then there's a bit of a uh, correction, if you will, in 2022, where things decreased again. Um, for the most part, um, the utilization uh, in 2022 has not come back um, you know, to pre-pandemic or 2019 levels. That's what we saw for these uh, six conditions that are, um, you know, listed here. Asthma, behavioral health, which include depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, cancers, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and um, hyperlipidemia. What about preventive care, right? Preventive care, by definition, became um, something that had to be delayed or deferred during the pandemic uh, months. So most of 2020 and quite a you know quite a few months into 2021, we saw that. Um, so all of your cancer screenings or your uh, you know uh, follow-ups if you're diabetic with nephropathy screening or retinopathy screening, cholesterol um, screening, all of those types of things had to be deferred. And we saw a pretty similar, um, you know, trend, as you can see. And again, some of them, like colon cancer screening, the, because the numbers in this um, data set were low, they look like they stayed fairly flat. But if you look at some of the others, like LDL screening, or um, which is at the top, that yellow line there, or the nephropathy screening and 
um, you know, the cancer screenings and such, they again followed a very similar trend as to what we saw for the chronic conditions on the previous slide. Um, so the bar chart on the right, you can see it's comparing the 2019 um, utilization levels um, to 2022. And we can see that it's not fully recovered. So the, the light um, faded gray bars are the 2019 numbers and the, the, the blue teal bars are the 2022 numbers. And you can see that they have not quite fully recovered. So we're getting there, but we're not back to pre-pandemic levels. So that's some of the you know, interesting trends that we need to really think back on because for some of these, um, you know, conditions like the colon cancer or the retinopathy screening and such, you can see that the per thousand services that we have, they were not high to begin with. And then they fell further and they are not back to even those levels. So that's the part that is still concerning. So <clears throat> let me ask this question now to the audience. Now that we know about this, um, what else would we like to know about a data set like this? Joanne, if you would kindly load the poll, we have a poll there for you. Um, <clears throat> so the poll question is that the plan utilization for preventive care and ongoing care for chronic conditions have generally improved, um, <clears throat> but they haven't really come back to 2019 levels. How, what else would you like to investigate about this data set? Would you like to know more about the social and demographic factors that influence um, these uh, types of care? Would you like to um, you know, uh, look more into the cost trends? Would you like to look at disease burden? You know, because increases in utilization can be tied to increases in disease burden, which uh, basically is about people that did not get the right care in 2020. When they came back in 2021 and 22, are they sicker than they were? So understanding that. Which subpopulations um, do we see that there was no increase in the preventive care utilization in 2021 and 22? What about subpopulations that would benefit most from targeted interventions? Now, all of these are important, I know, but um, I'm just trying to understand if you had to prioritize and pick one, which one would that be? So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes, a couple seconds to still respond. Please do respond to the poll. That would help a lot um, to see, you know, where, what you guys are thinking. Okay, let's give it maybe five more seconds, Joanne. like the Jeopardy music, right? Okay, all right, so the poll has closed and what we're seeing is, let's see, about um, a lot of you have talked about, uh, you know, social and demographic factors influencing the preventive and ongoing care, about 29%. And then the next winner at 23% came what the subpopulations that would benefit from targeted interventions are. Yeah, I mean, that is um, really what we're seeing with our customers as well. Social and, um, you know, cultural inequities um, have been there um, ever since, uh, you know, like way before 9-11. Uh, did I just say 9-11? I am so sorry. Before the pandemic. See, in my head, the pandemic is like a 9-11 event we're always going to be talking about before and after. So I'm sorry. Anyway, so uh, before the pandemic in 20, you know, in 2019, 18, even before that, we've had these. The, the thing that happened with COVID is that it exposed this and brought it in, you know, gave it the light of day. So yes, all of us want to know more about that. So I completely understand. And let's take a look at what we found in some of these data sets, right? So what were the influences of some of those social determinants on these care patterns that we just saw? So one of the things, so, you know, when we're starting to look at, um, you know, social determinants, one of the first things that usually comes to mind is um, income disparity. So in our um, Enlight tool at HDMS has a bunch of different indices that we can leverage um, to look at data. So the first one we looked at was through income index. And to just keep things simple, we said, let's just take two of the most common conditions, um, which again, also uh, from um, 
you know, from a, a intervention standpoint, there are a lot of resources available with third party solutions, care management, all kinds of things for diabetes and hypertension. So let's look at how the utilization pans out. And if you look at the data, and this was true for each year, this data is for 2021, but it would, this was the exact same trend we saw across the board year over year. So as you can see, uh, on the left side, um, we have the, the low, very low quantiles, which means those are members that fall into the um, very low income or low income um, strata. And then on the right, you have the high and the very high um, or people that are obviously um, making much more money. So uh, in, in a higher income um, you know, group. You can see that the utilization is directly proportional to the income level of the individual. Now, um, we understand that you know, diabetes or hypertension prevalence uh, is not based on people's income levels. We know that you know, it um, hits people equally, right? So what this tells us is that people are more likely to seek care if they are in a higher income bracket. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is, again, something that we've already known. This just helps us quantify it. Like how different is it? How much more utilization? How many more people are seeking care um, when it comes to these um, you know, income disparities? And one more thing I should point out um, is that in this um, case, if you're wondering, uh, you know, where are, you know, how are we getting the income index data? It is based off of census block data. So uh, all of the 75 or 80 plus, um, uh, you know, employers um, in this data set are not really bringing in income data for all of their um, uh, employees. That's not how this is based off of. This is based off of people's um, zip code and how that relates to the um, income disparities based off of census level data. So the idea being you don't have to have um, an income data point to be able to leverage um, these types of um, you know, insights. So these are available using you know, such um, census block and other data sets. <clears throat> so what else do we know about this? So we looked at uh, you know, diabetes and hypertension. Something interesting happened when we looked at the behavioral health um, utilization. Same thing, you're looking at the income index. We're looking now at members who have either depression, anxiety, or bipolar disorder, or a combination of any of those. Um, and we found that um, the, the trend is actually going in the opposite direction. You've got a lot more utilization among members um, that fall within the very low and low um, you know, uh, quantiles of income than the ones with high or very high. So that was definitely interesting. And that kind of made me, made us as a team wonder, why would that be? So let's kind of think this through. And so we started to think about, in addition to index, what else would be a good, um, you know, uh, parameter to use um, to look at this data? So we looked at, okay, so access to care has always been um, something that um, drives inequities within um, you know, the, the population, health inequities. So we looked at something called the Health Infrastructure Index. Again, this is based off of census block data. If anyone's interested in the, um, you know, in, in the information behind it, by all means, put a note in the chat and um, you know, we can get that out to you. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at health infrastructure index, and again, um, the trends are very similar. The two, um, the, the, the two light grayed out uh, bars are diabetes and hypertension again, and the, the, dark, the teal bar here that you see is for uh, behavioral health. So again, you have more people that are accessing care where they have access to good health infrastructure. Again, something that um, follows logic, sure. If you have more access, you're probably gonna get more care, sure. For when it comes to diabetes and hypertension. 
But when it comes to behavioral health, we found more people within the lower quantiles accessing more care. So again, how do we make sense of this, right? So we looked at something more. So <clears throat> when we went through the data and, oh, before I get to what else we looked at, we also found a very similar uh, trend with not just um, behavioral health, but with dermatology. That was another area where we saw that with um, the uh, people in the lower, um, in, uh, lower income and with lower access to health infrastructure seem to have higher utilization. So this was interesting. I mean, because um, behavioral health and dermatology are two, um, you know, uh, uh, fields which I started to think are they more amenable to uh, being cared for virtually, right? Like that was kind of the the direction that we started to think about. And so we looked at one other <clears throat> area, which I'll get to in a minute. But so <clears throat> when we when we looked at this, so I'm going to backtrack just a little bit here. Um, when we looked at um, just for diabetes and hypertension, right? So across the income index and the health infrastructure index. So you can see that when we put both of them side by side, there is a higher utilization. So on the right, you have the health infrastructure index. Um, you can see that there's more utilization um, in the you know, on the health infrastructure side for the group that has very low access to health infrastructure when compared to the income. So the, the point being, the members that live in the low income and very low income zones are likely also the ones that are in the areas with lower infrastructure. Makes sense, right? Like all of us living in uh, different communities, if you're living in a wealthier community, you probably have, um, you know, a, a tertiary grade hospital in your backyard. Um, and it, sometimes if you're not living in that sort of a community, you don't, you have to travel 30 or 40 minutes to get there. So think about that. So when we looked at that and we said, okay, so there, there is a lot more utilization, um, you know, in that in, in that group, um, you know, so like when we look at the infrastructure index, there is at least one group over there or maybe two subgroups within that smaller group that is, uh, you know, accessing more care when it comes to, um, you know, the, the people in that low income uh, uh, strata. So if we dug deeper into that group, so if we look at that group more closely, which has, um, you know, low income, falls into that very low income um, uh, strata, what happens then? We looked at them and found that they were the ones that were in the low and very low income group. They also had a low infrastructure index but they had a high technology access index. That's another one of those indices that is a big um, influencer of care, because let's think about virtual care became such a big deal and we're all talking about it in 2021 and now in 2022, we're expanding into those. We found that in that particular data set, especially there were pockets of, members that had access to uh, like the, where their technology access was high. So now how do you use this information, right? Like knowing all of this, we started out with those 250,000 members and then now we whittled it down and we're looking at this smaller group now. Now this stands to reason we can say that maybe those are the communities where virtual primary care networks might be a, a good solution. They don't have um, access to very good health infrastructure, but you know their broadband and other technology seems to be really good. So they would be um, the right candidates um, to be enrolled in virtual primary care networks and maybe having um, the right um, telehealth vendors in those markets probably makes, um, you know, good sense. <clears throat> so as we go more into this and look at, you know, we looked at primary, um, you know, preventive care screenings. Remember when we started out, one of the things we noticed, which we thought was interesting, is 
when it came to preventive care, preventive care screenings, just cancer screenings, these are breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screenings, um, we saw that actually the, um, the utilization, people getting more screenings was higher in the lower income groups. So the low and the very low income groups seem to have a lot more utilization, like they had more mammograms and more pap smears than people in the higher income groups. Yes, I was surprised by this too. And so that's why we looked at patterns over time. And guess what? So when you look at that right hand um, graph, um, which looks at the same three cancer screenings over time, broken out by the income index quantiles on the uh, bottom axis there, you can see that those patterns are consistent over time. So it does follow that people um, in the lower in, you know, income um, indices actually do get their mammograms and pap smears at a high, much higher rate and colonoscopies for that matter, at much higher rates than those not in those income brackets. Something you know I had not thought about. I would not have um, you know hypothesized that at all. But that's what we saw within the data. So that's um, you know something unexpected there. <clears throat> so we talked about like ten things at this point, right? So how can we use this? So you're going to come back and say, okay, Rani, that is all fine, well and good. You've got income index, infrastructure index, and access to um, technology. We have indices for access to health insurance. How does all of that help? What can we do with this? So what our customers have done is really look at this and say, okay, it's one thing to look at the utilization. What about the costs? So if you look at the, the top left um, graph there, that is looking at the utilization. So um, number of um, people that had claims annually and their um, per member per month costs in um, you know allowed costs. So that kind of takes into account all of the out-of-pocket costs as well. Um, and we see that that is not really giving us a very a clear picture. It kind of keeps going up and down a little bit. <clears throat> So then the question comes in, so what exactly, um, how many people are we talking about and what, what condition are we talking about? What should be our strategy here? So we looked at this and said, okay, let's think about cancer because cancer for the most part is one of the top cost drivers for almost every single employer in the country. Um, it, it is the one that sometimes um, will uh, you know, some smaller companies, mid-market companies, sometimes um, their pocketbooks are, uh, so, you know, they, they go into the red just because two or three people within their population of 500 or something have cancer. Just that will put them in the red, right? So we looked at simply cancer care. And that's where like this PM, PM cost is not telling me much. So we looked at, okay, how many people are we talking about? So this particular data set of the 250,000, we had about 17,000 odd people in 2022 that had claims for cancer care. So it's about 7% or so of their uh, membership, right? And then on the right, we started to look at um, those members now by health infrastructure index. So people that have access to good health care versus those that don't. And that was a little bit more telling than just when we looked at it just by income. So that's kind of the, the point that I was trying to get to is, you know, sometimes just looking at it by one index may not be enough. We may have to go deeper and dig a little bit and do more um, to see where those differences are. So what did we find? So first thing, that light uh, blue line there, that, um, you know, aqua colored line um, that you see is giving me the distribution of all of the members. So what we see is most of our members are living in those um, low, very low or medium access to health infrastructure zones, right? Like that, <clears throat> that line that's going straight down, that's telling us that most of the people are living within those zones. So most of that population of the, that 17,000 people are living where you probably don't have great access to healthcare, okay? 
And then now when we look at the PM, PM costs for those people, there is no doubt that it is costing um, them more on a PM, PM basis. For the people in the very low infrastructure access zone, the PM, PM was at $68 or almost 69 versus about $55 um, at the other end of the spectrum for the very high. So that itself, I mean, that's a PM, PM cost, right? Like that's almost a 25% cost increase. So I think that is the takeaway to say that it is costing us as a plan more money um, to care for people that live in areas that um, don't have great access to health infrastructure. So again, that goes to how can we structure better products um, for these members, so, uh, or you know, maybe expand the networks, um, maybe have more um, uh, out of network providers that they could see for um, specialties like oncology that would be paid out at um, you know in network rates or something like that, which would make sure that people get the care that they need when they do need it. <clears throat> One other area that we looked into is, you know, out of pocket expense, because again, when we talk about health inequities, um, how much um, out of pocket somebody has to pay will greatly determine their access to that kind of care. So I know that this uh, particular slide is not, um, you know, things are really small. So if you would like to go to full screen mode, please do so to uh, look at it better. But essentially what we did for the um, cancer care, we looked at the top five facilities um, for, you know, where people were getting care. The same, um, you know, hospitals, the same specialties, uh, specialists, I should say, et cetera. And then we looked at the out-of-pocket expense per person per event. And what we saw there again was for at, at the same um, facility, the people in the very low um, quantile were definitely paying a lot more out-of-pocket. Now, I know that the out-of-pocket expenses are, is, a is a direct function of the type of plan that uh, members enroll in. I understand that. <clears throat> the point is, for those members, obviously, that fall into those um, quantiles, like they are in the low or very low income quantile, low or very low uh, health infrastructure quantile, they may tend to choose those plans where the upfront cost to them, like in the form of premiums, are much lower. And so, in you know, when they don't get sick and everything is good, things work out really well. But when something like cancer happens, then it becomes a really tough hardship. And so that is something that we wanted to show here because we're not even saying that these are people that went to one facility or another facility. This is the same facility. Somebody that, um, you know, uh, is living in, um, you know, the same region, going to the same hospital, depending on the type of plan they have, they are, you know, their out of pocket is more. So now that definitely becomes a barrier, right? So that is the, you know, that's what I was trying to kind of get to here. And we can do that using all of these indices. So before I hand it over to um, my esteemed colleague, Kelly here, I just wanted to say that the point that I'm trying to make here is yes, um, health inequities. Again, we can uh, speak to a lot of them using uh, analytics. Uh, but what we have to always understand is that's not the end of the story. There is more healthcare costs. Um, you know, like if you're watching an infomercial, it'll say, but wait, there's more just like that. There's more. And Kelly's going to talk to you guys about those other costs of healthcare to our employers. There you go, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Rani. Okay, I want to kind of, that was a lot of extremely detailed and really deep information. And I, and I think that it's important to understand that you all, as health plans, obviously, are the ones that many employers depend on to bring those types of deep insights. Working with your data warehouse provider, working with your consulting partners, but bringing those insights back to your employers, your clients is, you know, obviously making you guys the rock stars and uh, seeming like you have a handle on these really big challenges. So let's talk about these really big challenges. Why are we here? 
and why do you care? Um, delayed care, and, and I will say, you know, 36 years I spent of my career at health plans, and now here I am at IBI, which is, you know, an educational and productivity uh, expert in the field. These conversations around delayed care uh, and what Dr. Ronnie was showing you, the reason that, in my opinion, the reason that nothing really jumped off the page from an, oh my God, we need to do something about this particular issue right now, is because, as Dr. Ronnie said, not all of the healthcare expenses are in healthcare. While people suppressed care, obviously, in 2020, into 2021, and from what we're seeing, continuing into 2022, in things like preventive care, cancer screenings, et cetera, the scary things, they were costing the employer that you sit down with at a QBR every quarter money elsewhere. And it is my supposition that we've not seen this hit yet. So I saw a couple of questions in the question boxes. Um, do we think that this is going to come back around? I do. And I think it's going to start in 2023 and continue into 2024. It is just logical to all of us that if we had cancer patients in early stages in 2020 who delayed or avoided care during the pandemic, they're coming back into the system much sicker, right? So that health risk indices has gone up. And we at IBI are actually doing a research project on this topic as we speak. In that research questionnaire that we are sending out to um, 5,000 employees that are covered in national account size and mid-market size clients, we are asking the questions about why they delayed care. We would really like to think about this in two buckets. Those during the pandemic, obviously delayed care or avoided care for two different reasons. One, fear, getting COVID, spreading COVID, or systematically not being able to access the care they needed. Doctor's office closed, hospitals only taking COVID patients, et cetera. Here we are in 2023. We want to know why people are continuing to delay care and if they are continuing to delay care. We've seen some early research on things like women are not getting cancer screenings and but they will get their children their screenings and their immunizations their well visits and their immunizations and we want to know why that's happening we think the fear bucket has moved aside and we are now firmly back in the barriers to care bucket which dr ronnie spoke a lot about right so if people are not getting care now we're asking them what reasons they're not getting that care and we think that it's going to have a lot to do with convenience, financial restrictions, time, um, not being able to take time off of their job, et cetera. So um, there still are some access issues within the healthcare system, we believe, but for the most part, what we're getting back in our survey results is that we're, um, or, or it, hope to get back at our survey results is to really zero in on why people aren't getting care and what you all should do about it. Because as you face your fully insured clients in the next two years, your self-insured clients in the next two years, there's going to be a reckoning. If these come people, people come back into the system as high cost claimants, the employer is going to look at you all as their health plan. What are you doing about this? Right? So it behooves us all to really look at this holistically um, and be ready for it. So I'm going to zip through these slides. Uh, in the interest of time and we want to give uh, plenty of time for questions here so as dr ronnie mentioned um, leaves trends and benchmarking help tell the holistic story i do fully realize that when you sit down with a client you're talking about the health plan results but being cognizant and maybe even preparing for the fact they're also going to hear from their disability and leaves vendors about what these same conditions same barriers to care are being affected in the leaves world um, be, be ready for those conversations. And hopefully you have a smart employer who's going to sit down with you at the same time and have these discussions with all of their vendors. Um, so think about overall costs. The business cost of illness, obviously, is what you all concentrate on. That only accounts for 62% of the total cost. And so when you think about the rest of the cost, which is the stuff that we deal with here at IBI, 
We're talking about the sick days, the PTO, the STD, the LTD, the FML, workers comp, and then that really important topic right now of presenteeism. If you're reading the news, you're seeing that um, quiet quitting and people who are at work but not really at work um, is a big topic. And employers are very much interested in measuring what that lack of productivity is costing them. So these are these are all part of the same people, the human who is generating costs on the medical side, costs on the leave side, costs on the productivity side and absenteeism side. It's, a, it's one person we're talking about here, but the big picture is bringing together all of this data. <clears throat> well, that went too quickly and then blank, apologize. So what we looked at in analyzing is, um, and again, we're thinking about this as the beginning of the conversation, um, a for a couple of reasons. One, in 2020, the data was so volatile because we didn't have an ICD-10 code for uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic diagnosis of COVID-19. So, you know, carriers and, and uh, payers and doctors were kind of dumping it into different buckets. But as we looked at care being depressed in 2020, we wondered what that care looked like on our side for people taking leaves and having claims in the disability arena. So you'll see in STD, it's relatively flat. So we had a depression in STD and quite frankly, um, that dip from 6.7 to 6.0 in the STD claim side was primarily due to pregnancies. We didn't have a whole lot of them in, in 2020. The years go across 19 in purple, 2020 in green, and 21 in, in aqua. Um, so STD, we did see a dip coming back, but coming back to norm. Um, that is the overall, and we have 11 million claims in our database. So this is a very large data set of all of the carriers, the payers who pay these claims. Um, that is not true for every diagnostic category. That is just, this is the book of business number, right? So, um, and then when we look at LTD, you see a pretty big spike in LTD from 19 to 20, coming back down a little bit in 21. And, and I actually do believe that in 23, that aqua number on LTD, you're gonna see that way higher because short-term disability is a harbinger for LTD. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then on the right, the FML. Um, obviously, the pre-pandemic number was at 12. Huge dip in um, 2020. Not unexpected. Many people were furloughed, on leave, out, uh, or, or off work, I should say, not on leave. Off work, um, got laid off, et cetera, in 2020. Comes back in 2021. And again, that number for 2022, we're just uh, about to release the 2022 data even higher. So what do we see really trending? And again, I'm going to keep saying this, but this is the beginning of the story about how delayed care and the suppression of the claims in the medical are going to come back to kind of bite us in the disability world. So, and I know this is an eye chart, so full screen is definitely recommended here. Um, but I wanted to just point out a couple of things here. 58% of all new claims, that's all the new claims we got for each year, are showing significant increases. So the biggest bucket of claims that we have are showing significant above 100% increases year over year. And delays in care and lower participation in your health and your health programs on the medical side and wellness programs absolutely impact the disability claim. So if someone is not getting care for cancer, not getting participating in a, a disease management program, et cetera, and you're not seeing the activity on the medical side, we are going to see it on the disability side. And we, we did a study uh, just recently. We looked at some data just recently that showed um, a group of people who had cancer treatment and they actually had one or two claims under medical and that was it, but had an STD claim because they were diagnosed at a later stage and went right out of work. Okay, so if you look at this chart at the top, 
in the gray bars are the percent change in new claims by condition. And this is 20 versus, uh, I'm sorry, 19 versus 20. That's incorrect, sorry. Um, and then the blue are the health conditions that Ronnie talked about earlier in her analysis. We just repeated those here. <clears throat> and then the little mountains in gray that you see behind are the percentage of total new claims. So what's interesting here is when we look at the, the conditions that were in the positive change year over year, we only see one that is a duplicative of Ronnie's data, Dr. Ronnie's data, and that's mental health. And that's up by 11% year over year. But when you look at the inverse on the negative changes year over year for STD, here are three more of the diagnostic categories that Dr. Ronnie talked about. So we're seeing a, a, a that same decrease that you're seeing on the medical side, we're seeing that on the disability side, that won't last. That will be a, a complete change in 21 and 22's data, right? When people don't get care, they come back sicker. This is, this is logical. And this is what we're worried about. And this is what the actuaries are worried about, obviously. When is it gonna hit? How is it gonna hit? How do we prepare for it? Now we're looking at 2020, 21 over 2020, even more change. So in this analysis, over 50% of all new claims are in the categories to the left in your year over year positive change categories. And you can see the diagnosis below. I apologize, we had to sort of break them out just because they're so hard to read in long, the diagnostic categories. So on your left, again, um, one of the biggest jumps that we see here for STD up 92% is mental health claims. This is 2020 over 20, I'm sorry, 21 over 2020. Not, not unexpected at all. We had lots of people we show in the medical data who tried to access mental health care and were not able to get mental health care. We put out research in the last two years running. We're doing it again this year on mental health access to care. People continue to not be able to access care, even with the advent of plenty of virtual care options. So STD claims year over year up 92% for mental health, no surprise. And then on the right, you see that the uh, conditions that are actually suppressed in short-term disability year over year. Again, some of these align, the dark blue, align with the same topics um, that Dr. Ronnie talked about, neoplasms, <clears throat> et cetera. That care's gotta come back into the system at some point. If it's not showing up in the medical and it's not really hitting yet in the STD, it, w it is coming. That is my opinion. Okay, now we look at LTD. LTD is such a long tail. This is, this is really just the beginning of a conversation, right? Because we won't see the effects of delayed care into LTD until the STD claims have run out. And so we look to STD for our um, you know, loss leaders, and then that typically carries over into LTD. Um, but what's interesting here is the in the LTD, 20%, only 23% of all new claims are in those same categories that we talked about earlier. And if you see here, some of these are the same indicators that Dr. Ronnie was looking at, endocrine, endocrine system, neoplasms, et cetera. Um, what we see in the negative change is a big difference here from 19 to 20. From 19 to 20, our, our gray mountain here uh, of the negative change, that accounts for a much higher, oh, I apologize, uh, percentage of all claims were in the negative or towards the negative categories. So we had a dip in these particular diagnostic categories 20 over 19. I don't think that's going to hold. Look at the change 21 over 20. You see a, peak, a quite a peak here in the year over year negative change. And this is um, for, uh, well, it's a couple of categories actually. I don't think that captured correctly. It's really endocrine. So we have a lot of endocrine disease 
in the LTD that is in a negative position change that is accounting for a large percentage of claims. We're, we're going down in percentages here. So in the analytics, 15% of all new claims are in the positive, much higher in past years. The question here for you all as health plans, and obviously uh, the, the biggest negative change here is the endocrine. You see this very large drop. Where are those people getting care? And, and what is the health outcome going to look like? That's what we're concerned about in the delayed care categories. The one that stands out for all of us, and I think many are most concerned of, and this is what I'm talking about when we look at the book of business numbers, it all kind of flattens out in the end. You know, we're not seeing gigantic jumps around in ST, new STD claims. We are seeing bigger changes in LTD, but that tail is so long. Those are from claims from years ago, right? Or could be from claims from years ago. Mental health, the behavioral health piece stands out. And so even though we talked about the change for short-term disability from 19 to 20 to 20 to 21, that increase isn't huge. It's 7.3% short-term disability um, in 2019, 8.6 in 2021. That's a lot of claims. It's not a big percentage increase, but it's a big claim increase. So we, we've gone from 145,000 claims in 2020 for behavioral health to 232,700 in 2021. This is a big change. This is going to continue, and quite frankly, I think that 2022 and 2023 are going to look much worse from an STD perspective. So while we can sit, continue to see people avoid and delay care on the medical side for mental health or behavioral health claims, this number on STD I, I, I'm going to predict is going to continue to rise rapidly because people are not getting the care they need. Long-term disability uh, was you know, much flatter actually going down a little bit for 2021. We will be releasing our 2022 data in, uh, here in the, in the first quarter of 2023, so we'll be able to update this particular information. So what's kind of the moral of the story here? We know that people who didn't get care in 19 and 20 um, are going to come back into the system sicker. In 2022 and 2023, we are asking, doing the research to ask people why they didn't get care because we are surmising that they are now in this barrier to care category, which always existed, not new, but as Dr. Ronnie said, the pandemic has exacerbated this. And so if they're still not getting care and they are as sick or sicker than they were two years ago, how do we get in front of this? So what we're advising is we're actually uh, um, kicking off a campaign, a back to basics campaign, which we house on our website, free to employers, which you all can use and have access to as well. Um, quantify where the people are, the humans are that aren't getting the needed care, at least the recommended care. Um, you know, use the task force recommendation list, use all of your uh, obvious um, standards of care recommendations and let's see who's not getting care, who hasn't had their preventive care, who hasn't had their screenings. And let's go back to kind of the old days of promoting, communicating, educating, and then maybe tacking on the piece about the barrier. Are you talking to people who need to see providers who look and talk like them? Are you talking to people who don't have the money or think that they don't have the money, I should say, to go get their care? give them the support, the financial understanding and education that they need to get them back to care freely. Um, obviously, for you all as health plans, collaborating with employers to get this data, like Dr. Ronnie presented, either through their data warehouse vendor or their data, uh, their carrier themselves, but start drilling in to the people who are missing out and are not getting care. I know it's hard to look through claims data for people who are not getting care, but we did it, you can do it too. And then lastly, hyper-personalize and target the people that you need to reach. Trying to control well-controlled diabetics is, is kind of a waste of time and money. 
let's go after the people who are not well controlled, who are not going for care, and we know that they are either ill or about to be ill, like the pre-diabetics. Make sure that that care is hypo personalized and targeted, and you're speaking to the right audience. So. I did that really quick and I realized our, our slides will be and data will be included, um, but I wanted to leave a couple of minutes for, for some questions. Joanne? Thank you. So at this time, we're going to address some questions that came in during the presentation. And our first question is, do you feel it will cause higher stages of disease states? If so, do you see it happening in 2023? Um, I can uh, yes. start with that. Um, so yes, the answer is definitely yes. Um, we started to see a little bit of that in 22 because um, you know we can look at um, the severity of uh, at any person's condition. Like we, you know, through our platform, we can look at the severity of their uh, conditions, and we did see that it is starting to inch up. It's not at a point where. I can call it statistically significant for all of the data sets that I've seen, but um, you know where we are, where we do have a large membership, we are starting to see that it's creeping up slowly but surely. Yes. Yeah, and I agree. It um, the the next part of our uh, research project is we're going to try and look at actual risk score over time of a continuously enrolled population. So that we can see if someone had a risk score, and I'm making up numbers here, of 10, which was healthy in 2019, and they were diagnosed with, say, prediabetes in 2020, what is their health risk score now if they have not had care for that diagnosis in you know, more than 12 months? That's what we want to see. Are they getting sicker, and are they coming back into the system at a much higher risk, which equals much higher cost? Thank you. Our next question, uh, I would appreciate any, even if subjective, insights for drivers of reduced preventative utilization. Okay, Me too. I can, uh, That's why we're going we're to ask that in our, we are going to ask that in our questionnaire. We actually are asking people, if you did not get your preventive care, why? We do, we, we are supposing that much of it has to do with some financial barriers or SDOH barriers. Yeah, um, so one of the things that you probably saw in some of the data I presented was like the cancer screenings have traditionally been higher in the low income groups. So that kind of flies in the face of the first hypothesis that I would have had here is, uh, you know, oh, it's because of the cost. So I think, you know, it's uh, important to understand that people now, especially with Medicaid expansions in many states, <laughs> understand that those um, uh, you know, screenings especially are available to them uh, with no out-of-pocket costs. So that's probably why those are higher. But for other reasons, so just like you know, think about your annual well checks um, or uh, a follow-up for somebody that has diabetes. So having those at least two physicians visits um, you know, in a year, those types of things are still kind of low when it comes to preventive care. And in my mind, uh, at least the, the sporadic data that we've seen, again, this is not necessarily a full study, so it may not be true for all audiences, but it definitely has to do with uh, social factors, not always cost related, but really related to timing. So somebody that lives in a place where they don't have um, primary care physicians that are open after five o'clock, for example, it's very hard for them to schedule a, a physical and go to it. So um, it is just that type of access. People that need to maybe um, take time off work and they don't have paid time off. So how do you do that? So those are some of the reasons that we are um, seeing and hearing about um, and studies are being done. So once Kelly has her study done, then we'll know more about it. We'll come back and present again. Is access to care a driver of higher incomes having higher utilization? Lower income people may live in provider deserts and not have any claims in your data. Um, I, I believe so. So, I mean, like I was saying, if you have access to um, the right um, specialists and the right primary care, the right diagnostic laboratories and such in your backyard, you're much more likely to go get it done. I mean, and I'll tell you as me as an example, my doctor's office had a 
you know, a, a phlebotomist in office and it made it so much easier. After my physical, I would just walk down two rooms. I would get my blood drawn and come back. After um, COVID, guess what? Staff shortages, the phlebotomist is no longer there. I have to drive myself to a lab. Not that the lab is very far, but you know how long it took me to get there and get it done? Three months. So, and this is a very well-informed customer. So think about that. So life does get in the way of these things. And so, yes, I do believe that, um, you know, people in the higher socioeconomic rungs of uh, society with better access uh, and more conveniences definitely have more utilization, especially for services that we want them to have. We have time for one more question. Um, uh, perhaps uh, we can follow up with the questions that we didn't get to Dr. Rani and uh, Kelly. Sure. Um, and I'll pass sure. it back to you for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, closing remarks, I once again, thank you all for attending. Thank you, AHIP, for giving us this opportunity. We hope to see you guys again. And um, I will again say that, uh, you know, the purpose that we're all here, why are we all here? At the end of the day, we all, I think, want the same thing. We want to make, um, you know, care uh, accessible to everybody at the time that they need it um, and wherever they are. Um, in a perfect world, we would be able to do that. Until then, what we can all do is come together for the common cause and figure out how best we can all work together. How can we collaborate? Um, you know, as health plans, you have access to a lot of things that probably the employers don't have access to. How can that be leveraged to provide better opportunities for interventions and care? Uh, how can you proactively approach the employers and say, we would love to sit down with your, um, you know, disability vendors and let's talk holistically. Maybe they can give us a list of people that went out on disability and we can tell you, did they have enough claims in the six months prior or, not because if they didn't get the right care and after the first time they just went out on disability that's a problem so those are the types of things that we can all do together so until next time keep good thoughts and stay healthy everyone thank you everybody our speakers thank you for that great presentation and for sharing your thoughts thank you to the audience for participating in today's webinar this concludes today's presentation Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.